Okay, so this is an oral history interview for the Echoes of the Decade project for the Culture Division of Donegal County Council. Um, today is the 30th of October 2020. My name is Regina Fitzpatrick and today I have my second interview with Mary Hart from Rafoe County Donegal. And we're doing this interview online because of the COVID-19 restrictions. So thanks Mary again for speaking with me uh, this evening. Um, so in our last um, interview, we were talking about your grandparents' generation and your parents' upbringing and, and stories that sort of had passed down from then, from them. Um, so today, I was um, thought we might talk about your own childhood and growing up in in Rafo. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about growing up in Rafo in the in the nineteen fifties and sixties? Well, uh, my parents bought the house um, that I grew up in uh, when I was three. And they, prior to that, I was living on the farm with my grandparents and um, we had nothing. And when I say that we had nothing, very little. My father bought the house in order to open um, business in it. So we, um, you know, we had lots of big rooms to, to play around in and ramble around in because it was very little furniture. Um, so uh, that was in the very, in the center of Rafo in the Diamond, which is um, a, a, an Ulster term for the center. It's a diamond shaped um, most of the people that lived in the Diamond were older people. Uh, we were the first uh, young family for many generations, I think, and we caused um, havoc um, in the town, I think, because we were always outside playing. But we, bit, we did have, we were lucky, we did have a big garden um, to play in. Uh, so I went to, to the local primary school, um, and that was St. Judas National School. It was a Catholic school. Um, we used to walk past the Protestant school um, and uh, we would jeer at the school um, when we would get a day off, um, like a feast day or a holy day that uh, the Protestant school didn't um, uh, take off. So there was that little bit of um, nice banter. It wasn't, it wasn't ever uh, anything at all like what uh, happened in Northern Ireland but you know there was always we always knew there was a difference between us we really didn't mix there's no point in my saying that we did mix that's not to say we were um, opposed to each other we had no reason to mix we didn't go to the same primary schools we didn't have a playground that was common we didn't go to um, the same dances or uh, you know as we got older but as young kids um, there wasn't the the um, preschools um, so you went directly from your home to your primary school, which would be Catholic or Protestant. So there was no reason, there was very little reason to mix, but for um, maybe sports. And that was very limited sports in the town that would have been badminton. And I would have played a bit of badminton as a, as a younger child. Um, but generally it was your, your um, my all my peers were um, Catholic. Um, I, I, didn't, I have to say, I, I really didn't know any when I was growing up at that age. And that is a town that was predominantly a, a Protestant town. I, I had a very nice upbringing, uh, a very good upbringing, but it was immersed in politics because I was eight when my father went into, mm. uh, was elected to Dáil Éireann. So our home became um, sort of the centre of um, political life because um, in those days, everybody you know the people were very poor i can i you know i do remember people the poverty um of people um who were in my uh, in my class you know i do remember that because we would have um you know had to bring our own lunches with us and you would have as children do you know you notice what other people have in their lunchbox and there were people who were very poor but anyway the politics of of where i grew up so because of my father then a lot of these people um that came to see him were his constituents and generally they were in need of something it was in need of a home in need of a job in need of something it was it was this with politicians and of old they were not legislators they were really people that you went to because you know there were no such thing as um you know, citizens advice bureaus and there were no you know resource centers um so the politician the local politician was was there was the doctor the politician and the bank manager um you know and that was that was how people managed in in those days so that was that was in the 60s so i was quite politically aware my father you know we would have been out with him as um as kids you know when when there was an election called there was great excitement in our home, um, you know, once the election was called, it was all hands to the deck. And so we would have been out, you know, stuffing literature in letterboxes or 
sealing envelopes or you know filling envelopes so we were always um aware of what it meant uh, the three weeks of an election i suppose it never dawned on us that if uh, our dad wasn't elected um there would have been no no money <laughs> coming in for unless he found a job somewhere else uh, because he had given up being a butcher um i was the eldest and still am the eldest of nine so um there were five of us in the family um one after the other so I hadn't reached my fifth birthday when my sister um, Rashi was born. And so there's five years exactly between both of us. Um, and my father used to always say, well, you're the eldest, whatever you do, the rest will follow. So there was always that uh, sense of uh, maybe a duty, but not wanting to have that burden on me. Um, but that was the way it was. Uh, so and my father was also very mindful of education. So um, I did my, um, what they called was, uh, oh, uh, when I was leaving prim primary search in 1967. So you did sit an exam. The reason that you sat that exam in primary school in those days was so that you could then be judged if you wanted to go on to a secondary school now there was no second there was no free education i was the first of the generation of free education in the republic so generally speaking when you sat your primary cert exams if your family had some money and you lived nearby a secondary school then you would have gone on to secondary school but you had to pay fees um and then you had you could get a scholarship uh, to a secondary school so I, um, because I was the first generation of free education, there was a big interest in um, secondary schools. And that particular year I went, um, I could have gone to the Royal and Prior um, School in Rafaud. It was actually the Royal School then. It was a Protestant school and, and a Protestant school for Protestant children, which is which is the, what, it, what it is today as well. But today you will find a, a good healthy mix of Protestants and Catholics kids going to it but not in those days not in the 60s in 1967 um and i would have been extremely uncomfortable going to that school uh, my father wanted me to go there because he had gone to boarding school himself and didn't like it and uh, but i had this fanciful notion that going to boarding school would be like the four marys it would be full of midnight peace and fun um so i'm being the eldest i'd nobody to tell me otherwise um so the school for people like from where I came from, which is Rafo, with East Donegal. So that part of East Donegal, the nearest secondary school uh, was in Letterkenny, but everything was taught through the medium of Irish. So I didn't, I wasn't uh, fluent in Irish. Uh, it, it, there was never any great emphasis on Irish. Um, so the next choice then was a boarding school, a convent boarding school, and that was either Ballyshannon or Boncrana, both of either end of, of the county. I opted to go to Boncrana because my aunt had gone there and my grandmother had um, been born in Boncrana, even though her family were from Derry, but her mother had relatives in Boncrana. So I had a connection with Boncrana. So um, I, I went to boarding school um, and from the minute I set foot in it, I didn't like it and I never liked it, <laughs> but I had five years of it. <laughs> So, um, and that's, I mean, that was, um, th that particular convent, um, the day school to get a capitation grant um, had to open their gates to boys as well as girls. So I was the first um, generation in that school that the Skullwara Bonkrana that had uh, a mixed or co-ed class. And um, strangely enough, I am still very close to most of those people that I went to school with. Um, we've had quite a few reunions and um, we had a 50th reunion a few years years back that, you know, we started in 1967. So we had in 2017, we had a wonderful people came from America and Canada and, and France. So we were very close for I, th I just think there was just a particular gelling because we all realized how important education was that we were we were privileged to be able to go to secondary um, school 
Um, now boarding was different. That that I you had to pay for that. That wasn't free, but but it was good. And so I I'm always mindful when I hear people complaining about the education system. You know, say look, you should, we have a very good education system. Really, you know, it, it, um, if you were in America, you'd be paying a lot of money to get a good education. So I was very aware of the importance of education. Um, so then from that onwards, I um, because of that, there were very few people went on to university because again. You know, unless you were very smart to get a grant uh, to go to secondary school, um, you you, uh, you would have had to have a lot of money to move onwards to to university. Uh, it was a privileged education. Um, but I got into to UCD. Um, most of my classmates went to Galway. Um, I went to UCD because my father was in Dublin in the Dáil, so it meant it was easier for me to be there because he he would have been there every week. Um, there's possibly, I, I may have made a mistake in that regard because all my friends went to Galway. Um, so I was very isolated my first year in UCD. Um, I didn't know anybody. There were there were one or two people from Donegal ahead of me that I did eventually meet. So I found it very difficult. Um, so I did spend a lot of a lot of my first um, my first year in UCD. I went to um, into Dáil Éireann and. I um, initially I took polit I, I studied um, archaeology and uh, geography. Uh, I hated it. I didn't like it at all. So I gave that up and went. Then um, I studied politics and history. And and so it was great for me. I used to go into Dáil Éireann, and I was I lived in a very um, uh, the politicians. I used to sit in the in the public gallery a lot, and you know I listened to James Dillon speaking. You know, I would have, um, I would have listened to. Um, Noel Brown was the one who always impressed me. Um, uh, he was very debonair, but he spoke beautifully. Um, they were, um, they weren't uh, professional politicians uh, or career politicians. They were professionals who then dedicated their time to politics because there was really not a lot of money in, in, in politics then. So you had people who were. Um, you know they were very dedicated that, that's my view of what it was in the 60s and 70s when i was um watching um you know i i, I remember like cosgrave you know old, old liam cosgrave um but i was older then when i you know gareth Fitzgerald. i knew then because of my father so um i mean i knew i knew all of them because i used to go in from ucd and get um meet my father mostly to to have uh, something to eat and get a free lunch or a free dinner from him um but the the knock-on effect of that was that politics rubbed off on me um in a big way um and i i um i was very aware um i've spoken already about being aware and growing up being aware of the um, civil war, being aware of my uh, grandparents and my grand uncle, uh, you know, being from one from Derry and, and and the other, you know, from from just the border in Lifford, and I'm I'm aware I was aware of all of that, you know, um, civil war politics, um, and um, so being able to see these people that were involved in in the um, in the war of independence really and uh you know it was amazing that i was so i didn't appreciate it i think at the time um i also knew uh, the man who lived a few doors down from us um pj ward he was a member of the first doll um Sinn fein td for for donny gall and he was retired he was an old gentleman when i knew him but he he um he used to give us out you know strings of licorice or pieces of dulse that he had in his pockets but I knew him, you know. So, um, so I think uh, my my time in UCD um, and and having studied politics and history, um, I then moved from that. I I, um, I got involved then in, in um, I, I went to uh, as a stagiaire to Brussels. So that was a great um, insight. So I was aware of Ireland's importance in the European um, arena at that point, because constantly we had. Um, not because I was Irish, there were about 200 of us from all over Europe. Um, and I think it was the Europe of nine at that time. And there had not been direct elections. Direct elections uh, to the European Parliament happened the following year. So I was in Brussels in 1978 for the six months of the stagiaire. So <clears throat> I um, always kept, they were always talking about um, the Irish 
Foreign Minister Gareth Fitzgerald has said. So Gareth Fitzgerald, I believe, has not been given the great credit yet of putting Ireland into an important um, stage in Europe. The, he was extremely well thought of. Um, and the team uh, in the Irish cabinet um, also were very highly qualified um, people that were working in Brussels. Um, so for that reason, Ireland became very, um, Ireland had become a very dedicated um, European country um, because we had to gain, not to lose. Um, and I, re I, I learned that later on when I went to work in Northern Ireland and Derry, how much Ireland was ahead of the UK and particularly Northern Ireland when it came to Euro European affairs and knowledge of Europe and involvement in Europe. Uh, but I loved my time in Brussels, um, but I was very impressed always with um, every, you know, all of the, the commissioners, they would refer to what Gareth Fitzgerald had said the previous week or at a meeting. Um, so, um, but anyway, that, that um, I, the, the stagiaire post finished. Um, and can I ask just, yeah, about the stagiaire post, is it uh, what I suppose? What was it? Wh what was day to day like in that role? Yeah. Where were you sent? Where Where did you live? Where did you work? What kind of work were you doing? What you have to remember is um, people didn't travel um, very much, and if you did out of Ireland, you tended to travel to the UK and to England to work or for summer like um, work as as students. That's what we did. Um, or you went to America. Few people really get, got, sort of graduated towards, or, or you know, were inclined towards going to to look for work in France or uh, anywhere else in Europe. So, part of the European being part of the European uh, Brussels um, scene gave people the opportunity, and that was you know a great opportunity for me because prior to that, I thought I would have thought you know sort of Ireland, Boston. But once I went to Brussels, I realized actually no, I'm more European. I am European. I have a, an affinity with with the Europeans more than I do have with the Americans. Um, so it was uh, flying out of Bru out of Dublin to Brussels was a big big scene because um, it was a um, it wasn't a scheduled flight from what I remember, um, and I actually missed the first flight um, for a very complicated set of reasons, but I won't go into it. There was a strike in Ireland at the time, a, a telecom strike, and anyway, my bag was on the plane, so I was one of the few people who had to go back out onto the runway, take my bag out of the hold on the plane because they couldn't let an unattended baggage on the plane to get to Brussels because they couldn't tell them in Brussels, actually, that person isn't travelling. Um, so you have a bag that nobody that doesn't belong to anybody. So for the security risk of that, that couldn't happen. So that was in 1978. Um, but I got there. I stayed. I lived in a, you know, we, we all, there was, I think, seven of us from Ireland. So that we were given a place, like um, addresses of different places that we could rent. Um, so I rented a, um, a small apartment. It was one room with a little kitchenette and toilets off it. Um, I became very friendly with with the Irish, but I sort of gravitated with the you know the couple of French and and Italian um, people who I still keep in touch with um, uh, occasionally, not not that much, but one one in particular, one girl at, in Aix en Provence, and you know she's come to Ireland and I've gone over to her, and, and we have been in touch lately. Um, I worked in the Press and Information Directorate, Directorate which was under. Um, Jean Claude Eckhart was his name, and he had been Paddy Hillary's chef de cabinet. So he loved the Irish. So I got on very well with him. So my job was really um, giving out information and trying to research um, how countries would embrace the first um, the elections to the to the European Parliament, how the um, the, the direct elect elections to the European Parliament would um, pan out. Um, so that was that was my involvement it was very interesting and uh things that i did we went from we were because we were privileged in being you know part of the european union so they were trying to i suppose it was a propaganda exercise really for um the european union or as it was the e it was the eec then and then it became the ec and then it became the eu so I don't, i'm not sure what it is now um but we went to berlin um i didn't know anything about um i i, I did not realize that Berlin was in West, in East Germany. So you had to go through East Germany to get to Berlin. And then Berlin itself was divided in half, so East and West. 
so I was, um, you know, I, I saw then the soldiers, like the, the Russian soldiers, and we were terrified of them. We were afraid we were going to be taken off and, uh, you know, sent into, into prison or something. You know, we, were, we kept quiet when we were traveling and it was very strict. Um, and so we stayed in Berlin and then we did have an opportunity to travel into the east through um, the Berlin, over the Berlin Wall and in, in, uh, through Checkpoint Charlie. And I, I remember I was very friendly with a, a Danish guy and an American guy. And uh, the other um, person was from um, uh, France, um, Denmark. England, yeah, and America. Uh, so we were we were together, and we had learned that if you go into the bank in, in Berlin, into the normal um, West Bank, or uh, um, you could buy East Marks four to one, whereas if you were at, buying it at the checkpoint, it was one to one. So you got a really good rate of exchange um, to go in, and we had stuffed it in our shoes or in a polo neck sweater. Um, and we were, of course, I was petrified I was going to get caught, but I had grown up in an environment where I was used to smuggling <laughs> across the border. So it kind of came naturally to me. It didn't bother me that's too much. Um, but, but that was that was a that was a good experience. But when we were going through, the Russian soldier looked at me and my my Irish passport and he said, oh, yeah, IRA. OK, off you go and you go. No problem. Then the next one was the Danish um, guy that was with us. Oh, yeah. Denmark. Yep. Yeah, because they were socialist. And then there was another guy with us, I remember now, Moroccan. So he said, oh yeah, PLO, and you go in. The American and the English guy were kept back for about 20 minutes and they interrogated them because they just didn't want to have anything to do with the enemy, the perceived, um, I suppose, you know, the capitalist countries that, that they were, whereas Ireland, even then, the Russians were aware of, um, well, they considered Ireland as being, the whole country was sort of, revolutionary <laughs> um so we did we and and i saw east germany at its worst um i had been very socialist up to that and i would have been arguing even with my father politically you know that the way ahead was a socialist country or a non-capitalist but what i what i saw in east berlin i'm not going to say it changed me but it made me question really how um how good the system was, and of course we all know it wasn't good. We were we were led to believe that that we we knew nothing. We did get to meet a couple of people when we were there who were um, cautious of us, and then when they knew who we were, they, they opened up to us. But they were all the time aware that that somebody might be watching them. So people were living in fear, and we exchanged addresses with a few people. And I remember I had denim trousers and a denim jacket. And I'm not making this up, but the number of women who looked at me staringly and almost as if, would you swap me? Would you give me that? Because they hadn't got denim. It, it was, it's, you know, it was then perceived as being the, you know, the image of um, America or different. They just couldn't get those. Uh, the, the, um, the Russians, I think, would have seen it as being a... You know, Levi Strauss was like, you know, capitalism and corporate and all that. Um, but that's one thing I do remember, you know, thinking, even when I went back, I thought, you know what, I should have actually given them the jacket. <laughs> it meant nothing to me. I probably lost it before I even left <laughs> Brussels. So that was that was a good experience. Um, you know, we did go to the European Parliament. Um, we did go, you know, I experienced all of that. So, um, and when I came back after the the time there. I wanted to go back to, to Brussels to work. Um, and I had been offered um, a position. Everything was very, uh, <clears throat> everything was really uh, around who was, the, who was the person in charge in Brussels for Ireland, who was the permanent representation. They changed a lot. So um, a man called Liam Horrigan, who used to work for RT, Liam Horrigan was in the office that I worked in, in the press information. And he wanted me to come back. And sadly, Liam Horrigan died suddenly of a heart attack while I was in the process of going to work for him. So I never did get back there. And I always regretted that I never did. It was something I would have liked to have done, um, but I didn't. And I, I just, I stayed, I came back and, and um, I was back in Dublin. Um, so at that point then I had to start looking for work. And in the 1980s, um, Dublin was um, in the like 79, 80, 
there was very little work. Um, I wanted to go into journalism. Um, you know, I ha I, it was kind of the next best thing to politics. And me, I, I loved um, I love politics and I love the, um, the the thrust and the cut and thrust of all of politics. But obviously, I wasn't going to stand for for election. Uh, and I was always impressed, you know, when I was in the doll watching the the um, journalists taking down the notes and of people speaking and then, um, um, you know, um, and, uh, anyway, for to get into journalism was very difficult in those days. So what I did was I took a job in um, Jury's Hotel in the famous coffee dock in Jury's and I had a, a nighttime job. So I worked from eight at night until eight in the morning. And then I went off and, and freelanced um, in the daytime and wrote articles and you know built up a portfolio, um, and it was good fun. I mean, I had great fun working in Jury's Hotel, and you know it was, it was good. The money was good. The tips were good because people were very drunk <laughs> usually. <laughs> at three in the morning when, they were, when they were tipping in, they'd leave twice as much as they would normally if they had their head together. Um, but I um, so I then um, I got a job. Um, uh, part time working in the Fine Gael press office because of my Belgian or experience, and I worked there for for quite a while. And uh, again, that was you know under Gareth Fitzgerald. Gareth Fitzgerald was the the, the leader of Fine Gael at that time. Um, so I I was such um, I had such admiration for him. Not not just because of my father. He he um he, he just he was such an inspiration. Um, I think he he was great. He was a great man. Um, so, and I used to meet him in Brussels, like when he, when he would be over, um, and he would go out with us. He would actually go out with the students, the stagiaires, not just the Irish. He would, and they were fascinated. They would say, oh, this is, this man is, uh, is the leader of your government or party. And he's happy to go out into the bars with us. And he was, that, that was him. He, he loved students because he was obviously a, a lecturer in, 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 in UCD. And he, you know, he loved to talk to his students as opposed to his peers or politicians he wasn't cut out to be an Irish politician I think that's the type of politician mm -hmm. today he would be but he was just mm -hmm. ahead of the time I think um so I I worked in the Fine Gael press office and I got to know a lot of the politicians then at that stage and I then used to write um actually they're all they're all somewhere in an archive I used to write for a magazine um Fine Gael magazine that came out once a month at at the time I don't even remember the name of it um it was a newspaper as such but a propaganda sheet of course but I used to interview um the politicians so I got to interview quite a few of them and write their their life their life story but I was also freelancing at that time as well for the Irish for the Irish press, which uh, you might find very interesting. Um, and that was by pure fluke. Um, my father had gone to school with one of the editors in the Irish press, um, Dermot McIntyre, and Dermot was one of the sub editors in the Irish press. But he used to come into the doll occasionally just for old time's sake and meet my father so I happened to be there one day and he was asking me what I was doing and I said well I'm I'm trying to eke out a living and I really want to, to be a journalist and I was writing for local papers and of course the Fine Gael magazine and he said well why don't you come down and see me I'll see what I can do so I went down I met Dermot I was interviewed by um 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 oh I can't remember his name's got to Pat Coogan um and uh, Tim had interviewed me, and uh, they were quite uh, bemused that um, I was, you know, Fine Gael in, in the Irish press. So I'm quite sure there weren't everybody in the Irish press in those days were not Fine Gael. But if you know, for people to understand, you know, if you were from a Fine Gael family, you did not ever let the Irish press, Devil Era magazine, newspaper in the door. It just never got in the door. It would be like bringing a pornographic magazine into your, into your grandparents. It was just taboo. And for me to be working, my father didn't have an issue with it at all because it was Dermot McIntyre who'd given me the chance. And, you know, I, I used to get a bit of jibing. And, and, and in fact, today um, or yesterday, one of the men that worked in the Irish press alongside me at times, uh, Jerry O'Hare. And Jerry O'Hare was... Um, 
uh, a Republican from Belfast, uh, never hid his Republicanism. He served time in Port Leash. He was a member of the IRA. He was a very good friend of Dahi O'Connell's and Sean McSteff. And I knew Jerry, Jerry passed away in the last couple of, two days ago. Um, but Jerry used to rib me a lot about, you know, oh, Fine Gael, what, what are you doing with us? It was always a joke, you know, um, the hunger, the, the, what will you do now when we're commemorating the hunger strikes or whatever? But I just, I just let it run off me. I didn't, didn't pay much attention to what they were saying. Um, but I, you know, that's, um, the, it was a good experience for me to work with the Irish press. They got me, I mean, they, I was, I worked, um, I used to do features as well as the, um, you know, the the shift. The shift that you got was you worked from nine to one half shift, or you worked a full day from nine to five. You know, and you covered press conferences and things like that. But you could also write features, and there wasn't wasn't a lot of money in features, but it got your name, you got your byline, you got you know, you got a headline. So I I did that. I wrote a lot of features, and uh, I I do remember I wrote one about how much the um, the Gardaí drivers of ministers were being paid um, because somebody had tipped me off that the, with overtime they were making a, a lot more money than the minister they were driving. So I did a, an investigative report about that and I remember meeting Albert Reynolds in the, in the corridors and he looked at me and he said, hmm, you used a different name but I know it was you wrote that. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, there, were, there were you know things like that I would have. Neil Blaney I became very friendly with. Um, believe it or not, um, if you want to ask me a question, do. But I, I, no, I'm letting you. And I'm letting you talk because it's it's fascinating. I've, I'm taking note of things to come back to with you. <laughs> but uh, one of the things when you were talking about the Irish press, I was going to ask about being a woman in in working for the Irish press at that time. And I, I'm presuming there weren't a lot of women. Maybe I'm wrong. And also, was there um, was there a kind of a pigeonholing situation whereby women were expected to write on certain things and men were expected to write on certain things or was it what was that like no i never got that sense no um yeah i um so it would have been about 1981 80, when i was when i was freelancing because um free, 80, 81 82 that period no um there were quite a few women there um and flaherty was there who became um fergal keen um the, the bbc correspondent um, his wife, she, she, they weren't married at the time. Fergal Keane worked there at that time. Um, but Anne used to take me with her to the courts, you know, because I had to learn, you know, how to cover a court report. And they would let people like me um, do the children's court because um, you could never name uh, anybody because they were under age. So you, you couldn't really make any serious mistakes because, you know, you didn't, if you got the name wrong and somebody, what they did wrong. But so it was it was um, an easier um, court to report from. Um, no, I didn't get any sense whatsoever of being a female. Now, my father did say to me when I said I want to be a journalist, he said, that's a tough job for a girl, for a woman. And I said, well, I'm as tough as anybody. I'm as good as the rest. And he said, you might think so. But it's when you get out there to have to paddle your old canoe uh, and it's a shark infested water. With, with the media, they'll be there first then, and the men will, will be tougher than the women. But I actually never really got the sense of that in the Irish press. Um, I have to say, I um, it was a very, to me, it was a very solid newspaper in the true sense of the word. They didn't embellish the news and um, it was straightforward and it was fair. Now, obviously the editorials would have been balanced uh, towards Fianna Fáil and towards, um, you know, the, the devil era still owned the paper. So um, you wouldn't have been singing the praises of Labour or Fine Gael. But in general, it, I have to say it was, I found it a very balanced. Um, and now I was freelance, so I was never on the staff. Um, and I know that, that they did the journalist eventually when, when the devil era empire collapsed and the, the pensions were 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 gone, um, and the staff were treated extremely badly. That had worked there. I mean, they never got any any pensions. Um, so, but at at the time when I was there, um, I got paid. I got well paid for what I was doing. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, you know, we we partied and mulligans, and um, that was the, the the other office. So, and you know, I got to know a lot of very good people, and and it, you know, 
I, I got to know the, the cut and thrust of journalism. Um, I did a fog course. I, I, I still say this to people. Um, it's great to have a university education, but when you have to go out onto the street and work, you do need the nuts and bolts. You need the skills to do the job. I think it's slightly different nowadays, um, you know, but so I had to, to be a journalist. I had to learn to type because remember, when I went to university, um, everything was written by hand. We didn't have typewriters, so I didn't type. Um, so I had to learn to type. I didn't have shorthand either. Um, so I did a FOSS course or ANCO as it was then. And it was great because people like me got skills out of it. Um, so I learned shorthand and um, because I needed that to, to report. And uh, you, you know, you never had a recorder with you. They, they were too expensive and they, would, they wouldn't allow you anyway to have a recorder. And if you were in a court, you weren't allowed to record and still, still would not, be, I don't think, be allowed to record. So the, um, you know, I, th that course, I did that. Um, so then what I did was um, I um, just, I did teach for a while in, in secondary schools as well, but that was really only to get me money, you know, that, but I had the qualification to teach. I used to teach civics and geography or history or whatever. Um, and I taught in Green Hills Comprehensive School in, in Walthamstown, an all boys school. So that was tough. That was very tough. Um, but I got on well with them eventually. I, you know, I, I, I broke them down. <laughs> and I do remember bringing them into the doll on a bus. Um, and it was an amazing trip for me to see them. You know, I mean, they, they really, um, they were in awe, but they'd never been, they, they were never in the city. Most of them had never actually had not been in the city centre. They, they, they didn't go in, you know, there was no, no reason to go in. They just, and they would have been, you know, pretty working class kids. So, you know, they would have had no reason to be going swanning around Grafton Street at any time. But we went to the doll and we went to the museum. And I remember one particular incident, you know, somebody had thrown a, an apple butt and I was young. I mean, I was only in my early twenties and the, um, one of the people at working um, in the in the museum came along and said, uh, who threw that butt on the floor? And nobody would answer. And he said, where's your teacher? And I stepped forward and said, I am. And he kind of looked at me and thought, you know, you couldn't possibly be their teacher because you're far too young. And then one of the guys stepped forward and said, oh, it was me, sir. And um, then afterwards he whispered in my ear and says, well, it wasn't me, but I felt sorry for you. <laughs> so, oh. so, so it was good. Like that's, you know, I had to obviously, and, and I always, and some, you know, one of them, um, I used to meet then in my Irish press days, I, I would meet him in Mulligan's pub and, and uh, I think he went to America, that particular guy and became quite wealthy, you know, but I would have met him and he used to say, oh, I always remember the day I protected you. So, <laughs> yeah, was, um, but going back to your question, um, no, the, the Irish press was, was not, um, it wasn't, it was tough to be a woman in journalism. It, it was a tough uh, career for women. But there, I, I wasn't the first. I wasn't. I wasn't the first of that generation. There were people well ahead of me who were women, who were good, solid journalists, and and had paved the way for for the likes of me when I came along. So there was no difference made. Um, I never wrote girly stuff. I I, I never wrote that. Um, you know, and I was quite. Um, my most of my work, you know, would have would have geared towards um, politics and writing investigative reports. Um, and I, I can, t I, there's one particular thing and, and, and I, I would kind of, I, it's nice for me to be able to put this on record because the story has, has changed. It's not a big story, but I was, um, as I said, I was working with the Fine Gael, um, press office. So sometimes they would ask me if I would, you know, go along and look after young Fine Gael. They had a conference in the Ashling hotel in Dublin. So they were doing whatever they were doing. I wasn't really involved in that. I was just there to make sure that everything was being run smoothly. And I was sitting in the coffee dock of, of the Ashing Hotel. And I spotted down at the very back a group of politicians, uh, of which Albert Reynolds was one, um, Ray McSharry, um, Sean Doherty. Uh, and I can't remember who the other was. And I saw them. So I went out and phoned the Irish press. And I said, look, there's a powwow going on at the back of the of the restaurant. It was during the heave on Hawhey at the time. And the Irish press photographer managed to get there as they were leaving. So that it appeared then in the Irish press back page, Sunday press, which is, which was far more important than the front page in those days. It was a political go you know, gossip column. And um, I remember a couple of days later, uh, I was in the doll and I met Albert Reynolds and he looked up and he said, that was you, I know it was you. <laughs> <laughs> off. 
it was but sometimes you know there are journalists i hear them talking about it and they have the hotel wrong they have it one's hotel and the night that they had the, the knives out for you know albert reynolds and them all gathered in the in this hotel or that hotel. it was that hotel it was the ashling hotel and i spotted them because i was at a finnegan conference and they weren't to know that there was a bunch of finneganers that they would be found out by the likes of me um so that that's um could, yeah, that's my, could, my my time in in um in Dublin. Could I bring you back to um studying politics and history in UCD um and s- studying there in in the the 1970s and up to the 19 what was um was the politics department or the history department were they party political at all what was the sense of of politics, I suppose, with a small p in yeah. those departments? Well, Morris Manning was um, he was my one of my lecturers. Um, Brian Farrell, who was presenting um, Seven Days, he was also one of the lecturers. So the polit- and in fact, the year that I took politics for three years um, for from first year. Um, that was the first year that it was a three year course. So I, I seem to be coming in on the first all the time, but I. I um, I remember I, I, if I had wanted to do it when I went in 72, I couldn't have taken politics. I had to go through uh, first year and then you, you opted to do politics as a two year course, but they brought it in as a three year course. Um, so, um, yeah, the politics department had um, th- they were they were certainly center right or sorry, center left. Um, um, they, it wouldn't have been a conservative, the, the, the politics department anyway. Um, they were quite, um, I suppose they were quite, um, you know, they, they were they were more into, they were quite into the publicity of politics as well. Philip Pettit was also, from what I remember, um, he was very good, he was a very clear thinker. And Father Fergal O'Connor was also uh, one of my one of my lecturers. So it was it was quite an um, I suppose a, a new politics. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it, I loved it. I I loved politics when I was studying it. I, I actually enjoyed it very much. Um, I don't remember if if Brian Farrell was the head of the department. I actually can't remember who, who the head was. Um, but it was quite a, an airy fairy department as well. It wasn't heavy. It wasn't um, the the history department was would have been quite different. History was well established. Um, uh, my I suppose my tutor was was Charlie Doherty or O'Doherty, um, but uh, who ended up marrying one of my classmates actually. Um, can't remember Fanola Cosgrove. I think it, yeah, Fanola, I think it was Fanola, um, but he was my tutor. Um, but after uh, beyond that, I don't remember, you know, Ruth Dudley Edwards, I think, or Professor De- Edwards was there. And anyway, I don't know if Ruth Dudley, if she was there at the time. Um, but um, life in UCD then was quite, um, it was what a university, I think, really should be, uh, not about what job that you're going to have, but that you had a broad experience of learning and it opened up your mind and and, and um i did a general you know i, I did a ba so i wasn't going to be a doctor or a or a, um an architect you know so uh, uh and um you know we of course like at the end of the year exams there was no continual assessment or anything like that you just that was it your you know your tutorials you did essays and whatever but it was um it was an enjoyment enjoyable experience for me i didn't like it the first year at all but i, I did enjoy it and did, at that point, I m- remember you mentioned the last time we spoke about when you were studying history in UCD, you know, the likes of Michael Collins or whatever, you know, he, he wasn't, I suppose, the, the iconic figure that he's, he is now. Um, what, what was thought of that period, um, if anything at all, in the modules you studied um, in history? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I don't remember going into any great depth into 1916 or into um, the Civil War politics at all. But when it did come up, there were definitely people had their own fixed views on the Irish Civil War and who was right and who was wrong. I do remember that. And I do remember having, you know, having those fierce arguments with uh, people in my class. Um, And I, you know, I think I did, it, it, it ran off onto me and I absorbed it. Um, that de Valera was the worst thing that ever happened to Ireland. It held 
held it back. Even then, I remember feeling that, you know, it should never have happened, um, that there should never have been a civil war. There was no need for, for a civil war. Um, so I was on that that side. I was definitely on, on a Michael Collins side. But who knows if I had been alive during that time, I, I may have been different. I don't believe so. Um, so I don't I don't um, I don't remember being any um, in any way. Um, bear in mind also that when I was in UCD, um, the troubles were raging in Northern Ireland. And that was and I had a northern accent. And I was also very friendly with people from Northern Ireland that we gravitated towards each other, I think maybe because of, of our accents. Um, so like I was very friendly and one of my, one of my first kind of uh, um, in the history class was uh, Deirdre McDermott and Deirdre served time in Port Leash prison. Uh, she was from Derry. She served time with Martin McGuinness and she and Martin McGuinness and, and um, another girl, um, uh, Marion Coyle and Dodie McGuinness and, and Deirdre McDermott, three of them were arrested along with Martin McGuinness, I think it may have been in 1971. But she served time in Port Leash before she came to UCD. But my father knew her family and he had gone to visit her quite a, quite a lot in, in Port Leash. And I do remember him saying that she did all the talking and Deirdre was 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 a person that was highly intelligent, um, but she was very, very political um, and very, very Republican. So when I happened to mention, oh, Deirdre McDermott's in my class, and, and my father looked at me and he said, don't be mixing with the wrong people in UCD. So he was quite kind of protective of who I might meet and who I might get myself involved. And he was aware that you could easily be involved in, in something that unwittingly for me, maybe he thought I was would have been naive. I wouldn't have been as clued into um, the dangers of politics. But I do remember, I mean, it was, we, we were living in, um, you know, I, I knew quite a lot of Republicans. Um, and I was in Dublin, you know, when the, the car bombs exploded uh, in Dublin. Um, I also traveled home every couple of weeks on the bus from Dublin or hitchhike. And we had to go through Northern Ireland and we would have been held up for an hour or two hours at the checkpoint at Ochnacloy. So it could take you forever to get home to Donegal. Um, and, you know, as young students, we, we, we didn't take too kindly to being asked to get off the bus um, or get out of a car or get searched in those days because we were aware that it was um, it was just a nuisancing. They had to do it, but the, often it was it was done to just make people be, get fed up going through the checkpoints and that they wouldn't be bothered coming from the south into the north. Um, and that was, you know, th those those were experiences. So. Northern Ireland politics was quite to the fore of discussions in my time in UCD. And I would have had a fairly wide spectrum of friends who were from the right wing of Fine Gael, um, who went on to be Supreme Court judges um, in Ireland, to the Republicans who ended up in prison. Um, so I would have known those types of people. Um, I shouldn't say types of people, but I would have been familiar with all shades of opinion in those days. Um, and did you get a sense that in those discussions with people who weren't from the north um, or who weren't from County Donegal, would you did you get a sense that there was a there was an understanding of the situation of the troubles or what was your sense of people's knowledge of it they didn't I think they really didn't um uh we we didn't have that many dublin friends to be quite honest uh but those that we did when they heard our echoes say oh god not another northerner um there was this blanking of people from the north um they it, it was like um I know it sounds cliche to say this, that people in Dublin didn't want to know what was going on in the north, but that is what it, that is true. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember, you know, in, in, in UCD, there was there was no love of we have to go up there and help or we have to, you know, we have to know and understand what's what's going on. Um, it, it's you were almost resented when they heard your accent and we used to, and that's why we stuck together. I think that's why people from Donegal kind of gravitated to people from Portadown, Derry, uh, Belfast, like we were, we were, we were kindred spirits, but we appreciated that we were regarded as different. 
And they would say things like, um, you know, oh, you're from Donegal, but you're not really a culture if you're from Donegal. We never regard ourselves as cultures. Um, don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> whether it had to be that we were close to the north and that it was always seen again remember this that it was seen as way ahead of us um because they, you know they, they had better roads they had better employment they had you know uh, factories were still working shirt factories were not that they were great jobs but there were still people had had um, people had jobs of some description women anyway i suppose in the earlier um days but in the south, uh, the north was always looked upon as being more uh, more advanced, more modern than 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 we were. But certainly, the um, uh, the attitude was, I don't want to know. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know about it. That 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 was generally the feeling that I got. Now others may not have got that feeling. And would you have had the sense that culturally, that you would have had more in common with people? you know, from the north than you would have had with people from the south and from Dublin or, you know, around yeah. south of there. Yes. Yeah, I still would still even to this day, even though I married a dub. Um, uh, they, yes, um, I I just felt uh, cultural, culturally, we were the same, um, whether it's the Ulster, whether it's, you know, that you're from Ulster, therefore, you you, you know, you identify. I mean, I used to have a lot of arguments in, in BBC when they would refer to the word Ulster. And I said, well, hold on a minute, don't be using the word Ulster to cover because that's the stuff you're really talking about the six counties. But I'm from Ulster. I'm important too. Um, so I, it, sometimes they would accept what I was saying, but sometimes they would say, well, are you trying to tell me that the Belfast is not in, Ul in Ulster? But I said, you know, but even the BBC, like having a, a radio station called Radio Ulster, even to this day, does annoy me because it, it doesn't cover Donegal. It's, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, I would certainly feel, um, you know, I suppose it's, 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 it's like everything, you know, where you're born, you feel culturally connected with it, uh, unless you want to not have anything to do with it. You know, so your town is important, your county is important, your province is important. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly would have would feel, you know, more at ease, you know, with. But that that gap has widened now of, uh, you know, of the last, you know, 25 years. Um, I think I I would feel uh, certainly now I would not feel the same affinity with with Northern Ireland as I did. I would still see myself very much as a northerner and as an uh, from Ulster, but I think we we have moved so far apart now that um, Northern Ireland has has been held back a lot more than we realise, and the Republic has moved quite far forward that we didn't think it was. So we've become very modernised and very multicultural, um, and we've thrown off the shackles of of the Catholic Church. Um, and the conservatism. So for that reason alone, Northern Ireland is still a very conservative place. Um, mm. It's very Catholic or very Protestant, it's one or the other. And politics and religion are very wrapped up in each other. So it's, it's mm. both evolved. I mean, if you're a Catholic, you tend to be SCLP or, or Sinn Féin. It's unlikely that you're going to be a DUP or unionist. So mm. they're both wrapped up in each other. Um, but that yes, I, I certainly in in the in my time in, in university, there, we were much close. We were much Johnny Gold people would have felt much more um, kindred spirits with with Northern Ireland than than we would have had with with Dublin or Wexford or Galway or. And and as as when when the troubles sort of kicked off at the end of the sixties, and you know. You you were still in school in in Donegal. You I remember you saying to me before that you still remember the fiftieth um, commemorations of the nineteen sixteen rising, uh, and and preparations for that. So I suppose national there was a nationalist ethos in in your schooling and and everything as well. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that commemoration and I suppose I suppose the thread of um, your sense of nationalism, given where you were, you were, you were born and raised. Yeah, the nationalism, I suppose, that I had was certainly um, it was Michael Collins. Um, the but the school, obviously, that the Department of Education had sent out. Um, you know, the proclamation was in the school 
uh, you know, it was put up on the wall and we had to read it. I think we had to actually read it every week on a Friday or something, but we, we had to, I, I do remember having to read it and made absolutely no, no sense to us as primary school kids. Um, and we had to sing Fanya Gallon Lay, which I know her off by heart to this day. Um, and I do remember the headmaster who was, in hindsight, um, probably quite Republican himself. And I think that was part of, you know, a lot of the, the primary school teachers in those days were from the Gelta areas um, and they were native Irish speakers because you got extra points if you in your um, in your exams going into secondary school or going on onwards if you spoke Irish it was um, a, a double marks or something like that if you were a native Irish speaker you got extra marks so it meant you had a head start over, over those who didn't um, so there was a it was weighted heavily primary school teachers um, in favour of those who were from Irish speaking areas, um, like Kerry's Ford and, and, and St. Pat's. Um, but I, um, I suppose, yeah, I, I had a, I had a sense of um, the the republic that I was growing up in, um, and I suppose that came back on me when I went to work. I eventually ended up working in Derry, and people would say to me, "Oh, you're from the Free State," and I would say, "No, I'm not from the Free State," and they'd say, "Oh." Hey, I thought you said you were from Donegal and, and I say I am but I'm not from the free state it's the republic but they never used the term republic in Northern Ireland then there, there was no interaction at all I mean they were immersed in a schooling that uh, if you were in the Catholic schools generally the priests or the nuns were telling you that they didn't recognize the republic um, that would have been the uh, it was it was quite Republican and the views, you know, it wasn't, it was obviously it wasn't part even of the curriculum <laughs> to teach and um, that's that type of um, history in, in Northern Ireland, Catholic or Protestant school. So, you know, that that was something that struck me in the 80s that it was still new um, speaking of the Republic in the way I did. And did what, when did you start working in Derry and start working for the BBC? I again, I went off and did a FOSS course and um, I've, I have such tremendous respect. And I think that's one thing that we really should be looking at is, you know, well, when I say we, that the Irish uh, government should be looking more towards training university graduates in skills. So I did a FOSS course in um, radio and um, training for local radio because there, there were no, um, in the 80s, all the radio stations in Ireland were pirate. Uh, RT was, was the only legitimate radio, radio station uh, in Ireland at, at that time. So the um, Countdown to Local Radio was a course that I did, was run by Car Communication. So I did that in Cork uh, with Gavin Duffy, who subsequently did, did go on to, to be a, a great, did do great things, but it was Car Communications who were running that course. And um, so from that, I wanted to get some uh, experience and I couldn't go and get experience in RTE because like, they just didn't take people in. So for, for me to get to sort of reasonable experience, I, I went to Derry. My father had um, suggested that I go to Derry because he said, oh, there's a guy from Derry is always ringing me up and doing interviews with me. So give him a ring, which I did. And um, Paul McFadden, um, I have to mention him because, uh, you know, Paul, you know, brought me into to Radio 4. And um, I came up and, and um, eventually I, I got a job there. Um, but it was it was a very different, I went to Derry in 1984 and it was a, um, a very violent place to go to work in. Um, and for me coming out of the happiness of Dublin and the fun of Dublin and the nightlife of Dublin and the, you know, just general, real, normal, everyday life, to go into Derry was a very big, learning very big learning curve for me in a whole lot of ways um i remember asking you know what's the number for the government information service which i was used to ringing up in, in dublin they say oh, we don't have we don't even have a government um and then the you know the editor said to me one day mary would you check the dhss num um figures I had not an idea what he was talking about um so i had to pretend a lot of the time um I remember my first phone, the first phone call that I got of a bomb warning. Um, I could hardly understand what the guy was saying. And I said, I'm sorry, can you speak more clearly? And when I think of it now, you know, <laughs> he was telling me that there was a bomb in a store in Derry and, you know, the, that they had half an hour to get out. And I remember looking around and thinking, is this for real? 
but it was. I mean, it was, it was a hoax, but however, it could have been real. That was a day-to-day -day kind of things that I was learning quickly. Uh, so I didn't understand the school education system, totally different from our own, you know, the grammar schools and, and uh, maintained schools and um, intermediate schools. They, were, we didn't, they didn't have secondary schools. They had secondary schools, but there weren't secondary schools like we had. So, you know, and, and there was Catholic the, you know, the maintained schools were the Catholic schools because they were maintained by the state, you know, so you had all of that going on that um, it, you, I used to say it was like throwing me into Manchester, um, going into Derry. It was nothing familiar about anything at all. Um, but I learned um, and it was a great, uh, I never left. I had no intentions of, of leaving Dublin and the, the great fun of Dublin to go work in Derry, to live in a dingy flat in the middle of Derry that had um, constant bomb alerts. Um, but I did, um, and I grew to love the place. And uh, I stayed there working for 25 years. And it was a very difficult time that I was there. I mean, I witnessed some horrendous things when I was there. Um, you know, like our everyday work was, was like I, I used to work different shifts. I could be working at six in the morning. And I also had to cross the border every morning to go to work. Um, so I had to go through two checkpoints. I had to go through an army checkpoint, like the British army checkpoint. And then I had to go through the customs, two customs checkpoints, British customs and Irish customs. They were okay generally, but the, the army could be quite uh, a nuisance and make it a nuisance for you at times. Um, that was my daily going in and out when I when I started living in Donegal. But I generally lived in most of most of my working early working career before I got married. I I, I worked in Derry. I lived in Derry. Um, so you know, there the the everyday life was covering um, shootings and bombings. I'm not going to say there was a shooting and bombing every day, but the, every week there was. Mm -hmm. um, so you you know your daily and your interviews were. I mean, I Martin McGuinness. You know, I I knew Martin McGuinness from. The steely-eyed, cold, non-engaging person that he was, uh, as spokesperson for Sinn Féin, because he was the mouthpiece. Then, as we know, I mean, he's he's not made any secret of the fact that he was the the second in command of the IRA in Derry, um, but he was a very powerful individual within Derry. But he was very cold, you know, like he he was a very very difficult person to interview. But then I, I learned, I got to know him, as, and then as the, as the ceasefires came and as he became engaged in politics, he became a different person. Uh, that same person was probably always there, but he, he, he played that role, you know, that he was committed to whatever he was committed to. He, you know, whatever he, my father, you know, said, and I, I stick to him because he had a very strong um, trust in people, uh, but he could read people very well. And he said, if Mark McGuinness says that he has given up the gun, then we have got to believe him because where are we if we don't? You know, whoever is a gunman, if they say they've stopped, then if you don't believe them, then it's never going to stop. So, you know, he, um, you know, I, I, so that was like, I knew Mark McGuinness. I knew John Hume. I knew John Hume very well from my father's uh, knowledge and friendship with him during the my time in UCD I, that when the SDLP were being formed. So I, I would have known him then. I used to know him in Brussels when he would, Gareth Fitzgerald and the Irish government kept him in in, uh, in a job because there was the, the, the storm had been um, prorogued and he didn't have any work. He didn't have any money and in, in the income. So he was on the Irish um, representation in those days. So he used to come out and he would, he would take me out for lunch or he'd take me out for dinner. And, you know, I used to have great fun with him. So I knew him then, as and he, and he and I became very good friends. You know, when when I was in Derry, um, and you know, I um, I had a tremendous respect for him. Um, and I, what was he? What was he like? If that's not too big a question for such a, a figure, um, but on a, in, a, in a in a friendship or in an interaction, what how yeah, what was he like? Well, he was quite. He could be quite dour. Like he was. He was never great fun when he was when he was being interviewed or when he would come into the office he would be quite stern um but then he'd, he'd come over and he, you know he'd say hi you wee girl you know, i have an interview i need to do would you do it you know so you know that that would have happened um but then when he when he would go out you know we would sometimes uh, you know the functions that would happen there was there was a nightlife of sorts in Derry. um you know john would have a, if he had a few drinks with him he would be the greatest fun to be sitting chatting and and having great fun um i always saw him as a father figure he, he almost you know he, he used to look out for me um 
and but he 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 was a very very um deep thinker you know he was very i suppose serious in, in his approach to everything um i only crossed swords with him once and it's a, it's a complicated story but i was at a press conference to the the launch of a of a what is now the foil site in Derry big shopping center and i asked the question it was a company from boston had been given the the contract to build it and I asked the question, why was it given to an outside company and not in Northern Ireland, not in a local company? And he really, really went for me, you know, as being a negative question, almost like Trump would do, would do to journalists now. And then he came up to Radio Foil to apologise about half an hour later. And he said, I'm really sorry. Look, you know, you got me on a, on a bad day. And, and can I do that interview again? And, he, and I did do it. And other journalists would have said, no, what you said is what you said. But I discovered... A few years later, that there had been a huge big bust up the night before between John Hume and, and a dairy uh, contractor uh, who was fuming about the fact that, that this had gone to a Boston company. And that Boston company actually went out of business and the government ended up having to pay for the whole thing altogether. So I asked a question that was an extremely sensitive question, but I wasn't asking it because I knew the answer. Um, so that was the only time I ever cro crossed the words with them. Um, and I suppose we didn't, we, you know, we we took it in our stride because he would he would be in really he used to come to Radio Foil a lot. He would come in uh, a lot because of people like he would be, you know, people in America, radio stations, and television networks would be looking to interview him. So he would come into Radio Foil and we would set him up and and put the headphones on, and open up the microphones. So you know, he was part of the furniture. You know, he, he was comfortable in the place and, and we were comfortable with him. He just went off and got him a cup, a cup of coffee. Um, and I mean, I was in his house frequently. Like, I would, you know, if, I, if he couldn't come up to do an interview, I would go down there. And then I I, I knew his wife well, Pat. Um, so I, you know, uh, but again, we didn't we didn't realise his greatness and what he actually really did achieve, especially in bringing um, the Americans on board to negotiate finally a peace deal um, and he was almost single-handedly really um, instrumental in doing that and they used to say well John Hume has got the bus he bought the bus and he got everybody on the bus but Sinn Féin ended up driving the bus and but John was happy enough for that to happen um, I think and you know I know that the SDLP suffered as a party but that was going to be inevitable um the two extremes in northern ireland there'll never be a solution unless the both of those two uh, extremes uh, like the, the the very extreme dup and the Sinn Féin work together the middle parties are are, are not going to survive the alliance and the stlp they're you know they're too middle ground for that mm. um and john saw that you know he, he did see it um, but he, he and and you know because of his health, you know he did have a, a an operation uh, in Switzerland that did affect his memory, and it just gradually um, he didn't have dementia. Like he 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 lost his, his memory, just started to fade away, and it took a long time for it to happen, but it did. Mm. And it was sad to see that. And I would meet him, you know, and and I I was never sure whether he did. He was good at bluffing who you were, you know. So. Um, mm. But mm. but it was you know I, I'm I'm very fortunate that I did live through a period that that he was at his best. Mm. Yeah. Can you can you tell me a little bit about um, I suppose when going to work in Radio Foil, and um, you spoke a little bit about the culture of the place and you there as like a Southern Catholic in working in Radio Foil and how how you fitted into that or how you were perceived do you think um can you maybe talk a little bit about that yeah they it's quite it's quite unusual because i i um i was one of the few i would say actually um i was probably for quite a while the only journalist who lived on one side of the border and worked at the other um because mm. people in dublin couldn't have done it so um i had mm. that um and so i think there was a lot of mistrust of me sometimes um I I got a piece of advice from a, a, a Garda superintendent when I covered the, one of the first stories was a bomb had gone off on Lifford Bridge between Straban and Lifford. 
and I was sent up and I was interviewing the, the superintendent and he said, um, you'll probably find you're out of your depth in Northern Ireland because it's a tough place for somebody from outside to go into. Um, and it was. And he said, I'll give you one word of advice. Just assume that every single person that you work with and every priest, every bank manager and every teacher that you meet, assume that they are in the IRA. And in generally speaking, you'll not be far wrong because the people that are in the IRA that are running the IRA are not the guys that are on the street with the guns and the bombs. They're the people that are educated and are moving. Um, so I was aware of that. Um, now, whether it was good advice or bad advice, but I kept my mouth shut generally. Uh, you learn to do that anyway in the North. You just didn't say too much um, because you could just say the wrong thing to somebody. I think I was perceived as being on, from the nationalist side. Some of my colleagues, um, I'm not going to say resented me, but they felt that I was probably, I, let's say you're, you're living in Derry and you're Republican or you're nationalist then you're, you're quite convinced that you're part of the south of Ireland or you're part of the Ireland. But when I came along, they realised actually they weren't because I was the new Ireland. I was a different, I was a different breed of Ireland. So they, they couldn't bring themselves to be part of me and my type of Ireland because I was not there. I was, um, I was the new Ireland. I was a, um, a different country, um, not the country that they felt uh, affinity with mm -hmm. and they didn't know much about the south of Ireland they hadn't time to know about the south of Ireland they were too busy dealing with their own problems in Northern Ireland they were too busy covering those stories to be bothered about what was going on in Dublin and in the Dáil that never entered rarely ever entered into any of the stories and in fact I used to have terrible arguments with the Belfast newsroom when, when they would say uh, the Irish Prime Minister and say will you stop saying the Irish Prime Minister you, why can't you say the T-shirt and I would be told to get lost but they do say it now so there was all of, of that um, and I think then from the unionist point of view um, my name being Mary Hart I think a lot of them actually thought that I was um, Church of Ireland or I was I was Protestant and they felt comfortable with me you know so probably more comfortable uh, they probably felt more comfortable with me than, than the, the unionists or the Republicans and, and nationalists <laughs> that I knew. But I was an outsider. I, I, I wasn't embraced. I uh, put it like that. I had to, I had to make. Uh, and also there was the attitude that I, I didn't know what I was talking about. And there was that that was true to a point. I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Like me from the South, really didn't know the the the... the it's like the milkman, you know, we didn't grow up in the middle of it. We did not go to school in the north. We did not go to church in the north, even though I was born within a spit of the border. I knew very little about what life was really like. So people from me, even though I was from Johnny Gall, I was still from the Republic of Ireland. That was a new, you know, a, a La Masse's Mass Ireland, you know, not the mm. Ireland. Island. Ireland, um, the Garth Fitzgerald Ireland, it was a new Ireland. It wasn't a place that they wanted it to be, Republicans and nationalists anyway. Still don't, <laughs> you know. And did did it surprise you when you when you came across like you know, Catholics um in in Derry, like you were saying that they you weren't the what they perceived Ireland to be or the older Ireland or whatever. Did that surprise you? Did you think that there would be a more of an affinity or more of a yes. I don't know, a welcome? Do you know what I mean? Did you think you'd feel more of a connection? Yes, I I I did, but you know, I didn't give it much thought, to be honest. Um I was immersed in Northern Ireland politics because my father was one of the few politicians who spent his time in Northern Ireland from the troubles began. He was very much involved from Bloody Bloody Sunday, if not, well, Battle of the Bogside, because um, he was a Southern politician that they called to. And he also had a lot of relatives um, in Derry and they would have been in touch with him. Oh, look, you're a member of the government in Ireland. You, you know, you better come in here and help us. So um, I, it wasn't that I didn't know or didn't ever hear or turn my back on the North. But um, I think it was probably I I was was not expecting to be it to be as alien to me as it was, mm. um, and also I wasn't expecting people to kind of I suppose I remember one comment coming to me, um, but you you people left us behind, and I said what what do you mean by that? 
well, the civil war, you know, you country was divided and then you people went off and left us behind Catholics. And I said, well, we had a civil war, you know, you do know that we had a very difficult time. It wasn't plain sailing for, for the new Ireland that, that, that evolved. So as a matter of fact, probably the Catholics were much better off. They had free education way before we did. So they weren't as downtrodden as a lot of, you know, we would have thought that they may have been. I'm not going to say they weren't compared to the Protestant community that, that had been given privileges in Derry. Um, for whatever reasons, you know, the gerrymandering and the, the voting and, and all of that. But there was, you know, there was a better health system. There were, there were, there were, um, the education was, was uh, free to everybody. Uh, we didn't have that for a long time. So, um, but there was that belief that uh, I think, all, you know, that, that there was a resentment that the South had left them behind. That's within the national mm -hmm. public community that we were, we, we just turned our back, which mm. we probably did to a point. Mm. And how did, I suppose, your, I suppose your generation really is sort of that, sort of the, your your parent, your your grandparents would have seen the War of Independence and then you witnessed, you know, the, the troubles and the conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, what do you what do you think your grandparents generation would have made of those troubles and the the activities of of the provisional ira and um how did it shape your own sense of nationalism it's a difficult question to answer um i propose my my paternal uh grandparents being um i i have to say were were republican but i don't believe they would have ever picked a gun up um I, I i don't believe that they would have supported the ira struggle um i think if michael collins had been alive was alive i i, I don't believe he would have had anything he would have agreed um because i think the the the, the heartache of of what they experienced in the civil war and the heartache of i mean the the war of independence a lot of it happened it wasn't planned that's my belief it, it happened because of 1916 which shouldn't have happened and it did happen that's my belief um I, and i unfortunately you know which was what i did <laughs> did study quite a bit of when i was in in ucd um that if the first world war had not happened and Ireland wouldn't have been put on the back burner. I think that the British would have been quite happy to have negotiated some kind of an independence of of sorts for Ireland. And uh, they weren't going to give the Irish what they wanted, but there was that agitation and, and Redmond and the, the 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 National Party. There was that progress towards Ireland taking control of its own affairs, not in a nationalist um, or any republican way. But as we see when what happened with 1916 and what happened with the executions, everything changed and there was no other way it could have been. Um, so there was nothing that that wasn't planned. Uh, the Civil War, I don't believe, um, would have happened like the, the War of Independence um, really was just a disaster of, of, of a, it was a the word disaster isn't correct. It was foisted upon um, the community. Um, I think it, it we, we probably Ireland probably would have maneuvered itself into some sort of independence of sorts and gradually, but it's it's difficult, you know. Every, it's it's not black and white, um, and uh, as I said, I don't know if I had lived then, what side would I have been on? Probably, given my background, um, my 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 grandparents, then that that's the side I would have been on the the Michael Collins side. But would I have been a uh, a supporter of Michael Collins's um, guerrilla warfare and would I have approved of that or would I have just said well that's what's happening I don't know what they said to each other about that I don't know what my grandparents thought of because as I said to you my father never accepted that Michael Collins was a gun man mm -hmm. you know it, 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 they, they, he was he was seen as the peace peaceful the negotiator and perhaps in Michael Collins is, is you know, I, I, I just don't know what the real Michael Collins was, you know. And this is what's going to happen is Mark McGinnis going to be the modern day version of, of Michael Collins, because those who knew um, 
Martin McGinnis close people in Derry that I would meet now and they would not they would not want Mark, Mark McGinnis to be these are Catholics these are people that lived him with in his community they would not want Mark McGinnis to be remembered as a, as a peacemaker so you know it just depends on how you how you viewed his coming out of war his coming out of his beliefs how it's coming out of um what he believed to be the right path to take and um i'm not going to go into the into the involvement or the depth of of my my father had a marriage connection with martin mcginnis um and they spoke a lot um and they spoke a lot when martin mcginnis was in the ira and martin mcginnis was a gunman and uh, my father met and i you know i remember in dublin you know my father leaving me sitting in the car and telling me to come over and knock on the door if I saw a guard the car um, and he would have been meeting the IRA in Dublin and that so that would have been in the in the early 70s um, but Martin McGuinness my father had a lot of, of conversations and I do remember my father one time saying to him how come you became so Republican because the McGuinnesses were not Republicans in Derry and they were they were supporters of the treaty and he said no that came from my mother's side who was from Donegal um, so, you know, Martin McGuinness's Republicanism didn't come from his dairy family, it came from his Donegal family. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. what he would have said. Um, that's not to say that, that, you know, I don't know how that, that would have changed, of course, uh, but the, the previous generation. Um, so, um, I've kind of forgotten now what the, <laughs> the, the, the main question yeah. was, but it, it's, um, you know, my, my, um, my political views have certainly been molded by my my family, my my grandparents, um, who were who were part of the Civil War, who were part of the War of Independence to a point. I don't know what their involvement was, uh, but they were certainly, you know, and they were Michael Collins, both my both my grandparents on both sides of my my family. So that you know that my and Michael Collins was not when I was growing up and when you know Michael Collins was not regarded as a hero in this part of the world because this is quite a this is border country um so it's quite Republican but but that has changed you know Michael Collins is now seen as being someone who was a fiercely important figure in Irish society it's tragic he didn't get to show what he could have done. It's been possible to cover the depth and, and breadth of your experience covering the troubles in Northern Ireland. But um, I suppose your the, the like you said, when you started working there, it was it was the, the, the most violent time in that period. Yeah. What, what was it? How, how do you what is that like working in that in in the heat of that and working in that context? And how do you how do you i suppose step away from it yeah well you don't step away from it it's there i um but it was um it was part of your everyday life it was part of your job so you just you, um you didn't think about it in a way that oh this is a terrible job i have or this is a really bad place to live or this is, it, it was like a phone call in the morning uh, mary will you just go and cover there's been a bomb or there's been a shooting you would go down it was it was based around a, a routine um you know you would get a statement from the ira to say they were responsible for the shooting and the police would come and ask you who who did you get the statement from and i'd say it was a phone call and how do you know it was legitimate and say so, well they gave a password a passcode and you they you had to tell them what the password was so there was a formula that you worked with the formula being that you reported the story you didn't get involved in in, in the story you reported it as you saw it uh, and he asked the hard questions of people. Um, I mean, I had to interview Martin again, and I had to turn him upside down. I also had to, you know, interview John Hume, um, you know, as to what he, he was doing too. A lot of the time it was to do with, well, there are no jobs coming to Derry and what are you doing about it? But there was also, you know, like uh, having to tumble Martin McGuinness. I mean, I had to interview him a lot in the earlier, uh, in his earlier days, but most of it we could never use, you know. And then of course we, we had to w work within the broadcasting ban as well. Um, mm. we, 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 then we got around that with having actors to voice it up and Martin McGuinness, you know, say sometimes he, he couldn't tell if it was himself was being, he could hear or, or if it was the actor because it, we, it was done so well. 
Um, but generally speaking, I suppose um, the things that, that I remember that stand out for me, and I ha bizarrely, I actually thought, I'll just check on, on what day was the Grace D mm. um, shooting, and it was today, you know? Yeah. And I heard it um, came a news flash, and I was in my home in Donegal. My, my children were, my babies were two and three that age. And um, I went straight to Radio Foil and I was dispatched to Altena Galvin Hospital. And my memory of that was sitting looking because the, the, they would only allow a pool. So I was the pool reporter for the BBC and UTV and uh, like I was a radio and television pool reporter because all you couldn't let a whole heap of journalists into, into a hospital. And I remember sitting and looking down the corridor. I can still see it, and uh, an elder. I, it, it really, it, it really still sticks with me so, so much. Um, an elderly couple, devastated, and they were country people, you know, with with the big thick shoes and old kind of country clothes, and um, and you know, th these people were not part of the troubles. These people were not anything. They were ordinary, everyday good, hard-working country folk um, that were, you know, the, the man, probably not even the woman, were in the pub. But they were, I remember seeing them walking down the corridor and thinking to myself, this is just not, this is just not right. This this could, this could not be right in any civilized society. That's the one, you know, that's the one time, and I know that but that was the one event that, and I remember Halloween was a big thing in Derry, which is, it has grown into a massive thing, but it was a big thing even then, you know, they were starting to get, it was the one night that people could go out and enjoy themselves, and there were a few nights like that in, in those days. Um, but I went out, I was working in Radio Foil on Halloween night, and I went out working on that night, and I drove around the city, and there wasn't anybody on the streets. And I saw, I think, maybe two taxis, People were petrified to go out because they weren't sure what was going to happen next. Um, so, you know, that was a bad, bad time. Um, the other time that um, when you ask me how you get involved and how you get over it, one of the last, uh, it was until um, the, the man Donaldson was, was shot by the Republicans um, yeah, who had been involved in, in Sinn Féin. The last um, Republican punishment or execution um, before the ceasefires happened, um, I happened to be um, called to, to cover that. It was on the border between Castlefin and um, Castlefin is in Donegal, not far from where I live. So that was the reason I got a phone call at five in the morning from uh, from a guard um, who uh, the local police or local sergeant. And he said, look, um, there's a body on the border and I'm just giving you a tip off now if you want to get there before the hordes of others get there. So I called a cameraman and we went and my own local doctor, I happened to see coming out of the Garda station in Castlefin. And he said, I, I, if you follow me, I'll, uh, I'm going to where the body is. And it was dark and we went and I remember we, we got there and normally, you, you know, you never get everything sealed off by the time the likes of me arrive, the journalist. But it wasn't and the doctor went up and I could see him just turning his head and and the body was lying there um, just beside a wreck of a car on an unapproved road. And I was there all day then waiting for the, you know, they had to watch to make sure it wasn't booby trapped and all of that. The area wasn't booby trapped for the British Army to come in. The helicopter came in and the body was uh, eventually taken taken away. And I can remember seeing the, the body, like the blue boiler suit and, the, you know, the, I don't know how long the body was there, but it, it was blue. His feet were blue. It was the first time that I had seen anybody actually lying, you know, with a hood up. And I remember that, I won't go into the detail, but the doctor, he was really upset. And we talk about it occasionally now. But I came home that evening and my children were running around the place and... I remember saying to my husband, you know, I was standing there at the side of the road and it could have been a dog that was there that I had not got, I had gotten so hardened to covering these stories that I, I, I the emotion within me wasn't there. I said, you know, it, it was the weirdest thing. You know, I just reported and the body has been taken away and it was like the body was not a person. But for a long time, the ceasefire happened and then our, our work and our day, daily life was different in newsrooms then um for for a while anyway and 
I used to have the, a dream of uh, a body pushing a, a car up out of the ground. And I wake up in the middle of the night until eventually my husband said, there's something bothering you, there's some story that you or something you need, need to just talk this through. And that's what it was. I had submerged this this story, this person that had been executed um, on the border, uh, shot in the back of the head. Um, I paid no attention again. Once the body was taken away, um, it went to Belfast and the funeral. There were so many funerals, you just didn't pay attention to. My mm -hmm. story was the next story. It wasn't the one in Belfast of the funeral. But the, you know, those are the kind of things that you, you you carry with you. You always carry with you. You never, you know, you you, you know, journalists are hardened, but they're not really. They're not ordinary people that take the story somewhere inside them and keep it there. Um, you know, and I was, I, I mean, I do remember my father even, you know, when when the soldiers were blowing up outside Oma in a in a jeep. Um, I can't remember many of them, eight, I think, at the time. And my father passed on that road all through his, his political career, like from the 60s. And he laid a wreath. It was the first time that a member of, of um, the Irish government did anything or the Irish, I suppose, at all. Uh, and he said, I have, I have to do that. And he, he left a wreath at the roadside. And I do remember, you know, a couple of journalist friends of mine saying to me, you know, your father is treading on really dangerous water here because they don't want this kind of publicity. They don't want people from the Irish government um, trying to cross over um, to say this is wrong, you know. So, you know, he was he was with John Hume on that on that one, you know. So, um, but he, he, you know, and I. Even when I go to Dublin, I always think of him. But I, you know, I think of the soldiers because there's a memorial there to them. Um, but we, you know, southern politicians stayed. You know, you stayed back from it. You know, it's you can't, it's not. It, it's the wrong thing for me to say that it's somebody else's war. You know, every war is always somebody else's war unless you're smack in the middle of it. So for the the, the authorities and the government in Dublin, it was somebody else's war. You know, they didn't that they should get involved but thankfully that changed and thankfully and hopefully it will continue to be that way um and do you think you know the politicians like your father from border counties had such a different understanding of what was going on than some of their colleagues in yeah. the door yeah. what was the um the level of that impact do you think um well my father was there's no secret of that and I'm not saying this because he's my father but um generally speaking he was he was regarded as one of the first and one of the few who who were prepared to go and speak to all all sides and he used to say well there's not much point in me talking to republicans or or Sinn Féin at the minute uh, or nationalists because they know what my politics are they know what the south is I need to convince the unionists that we are not at war with them in the south that we want to embrace them that we want we're not looking for a united ireland but we're looking for an ireland of united people and that if the people can work together then the the the, the rest will happen that they'll event it'll eventually the border will disappear and, and everybody will be working together and you know it's it's getting i'm not going to say it's it's getting towards that but you know when we see it with brexit we start realizing you know the, the best way for, for Ireland to move forward is to work together. Um, so, um, yeah, I think my father's, um, you know, his, his uh, working, to, you know, work, that hands across the border, that's, um, you know, that attitude of, of um, covering, um, to trying to be um, as, as, uh, to speak to everybody um and that's what he did and that's what i what i you know i mean I, he did a lot i mean he i mean his his involvement with the first world war was a huge step again and when he told me about that he said he rang me and i was working in the newsroom in Derry, and he said i'm going to um i'm going to look at having a monument uh, to the irish soldiers from the first world war who, who died and i said I, I I wasn't sure what, what he was talking about really. He had been, I knew the story about of him going to Belgium and seeing graves of Irish soldiers and saying, you know, we, we I I really should be doing. I'm in the right place here to do something about this. This is this is terrible. Um, um, but I said to him, you'll be shot for doing what you're doing. You know, you will be. Um, because the um for at that time, it was difficult to 
uh, say anything about a British soldier if you were from the if you weren't if you weren't British and if you weren't Unionist, if you you kept your mouth shut because um, people were shot for having anything to do with the British Army in Northern Ireland. People, you know, Patsy Gillespie, the taxi driver, was strapped to a car because he was driving supposedly, you know, people to um, or goods to a British Army base. So you just kept your distance from the British Army then for your own sake. You just kept your distance. So it was a difficult step for him to take. And around what year was he starting to talk about that, Mary? Did um, that start? It was 1996 when he went first, so the, mm. the right time that the, the Good Friday Agreement uh, was in the process uh, of being developed. There was a ceasefire. Um, so it, wa it couldn't have happened before that. It couldn't have happened in 1990 or 91 or 92, but just as, you know, as, as the, when the ceasefires were, were uh, called and, and things were changing. Um, that was it was okay for him to start speaking but it was still raw so it was 1996 when he went to Bel uh, to, to flanders to visit a grave that he had made a promise to an old man in donegal that he would do and he did that and um that was when he was struck by the number of irish names that he didn't realize the extent of, of irish involvement in the first world war nor did i as a, as a graduate of of history in ucd i was totally unaware of it um as were most people in ireland really unaware of the extent of it and when my father began to talk about it and said, look, you know, I'd like to find out how many people, there were, there were no records. They didn't count them in Irish terms. They were part of the British Army <laughs> Regiment. Um, and it was very difficult. There was no way of connecting with Ireland. Um, so it was a, a big, huge task, but he started it um, uh, in Donegal. He started a whole lot of, you know, getting information, but gradually they, uh, and, you know, with, with the help of everybody, with the help of the government, with John Bruton and Bertie Hearn, um, and Charlie Hawhey, um, they were fully behind him. Uh, he he said every door he he knocked on it was opened, so it was ready. You know th there was nobody resenting it. Certainly there were Republicans that didn't like it at the start, but gradually it, it did. It, it was the right thing to do. Um, so between ninety six and ninety eight, Peace Park was opened in nineteen ninety eight by the Queen and Mary McAleese, and um, that was the first time that an Irish president and a British monarch had met. Uh, in a public forum, but it wasn't in Ireland, it was in Belgium, but it started the train for which the Queen could come to Ireland and, and, uh, and she did him. And my father met her that day and um, she said to him, oh, so I believe you're responsible for this. And um, he said, yes, and I would like to see you come to Ireland. And if you do get an invitation, please accept it, because I have no doubt that you will be warmly welcomed, which she was. She was warmly mm -hmm. welcomed, you know, so um, it was just a, there was just a need for somebody to do it. And, and my father happened to be the person in the right place with the with the uh, pedigree, I suppose, and the the backstory of having been uh, able to work through Republicans and unionists. Of all, I mean, he was in the Sandy Row in Belfast. He was in, he was in the most. Um, I mean, his story is amazing of being in the, right on the, um, the darkest places in in Belfast during the troubles, speaking to to, uh, gunmen. So he wasn't afraid to do that, and he had got lots of letters to, um, you know, threatening his life as well, saying, you know, we know what time you go across the border. That was from Republicans usually because they saw him as meddling. In in the in the in their plan, um, but he uh, he he didn't mind, and I remember him saying, "Well, so be it. If I get shot, you know, uh, what I'm doing is right, and I'm going to do it." You know, and I, and, and I, he he actually said that at a um, an Ellen H debate that I was at when I was in UCD, and I remember thinking, "God, that's but you know, I hadn't thought, I hadn't known that he had because he obviously, I think he generally threw them in the bill when he would get the letters. He just ignored them." So who had that background of having been, I'm not going to say he was a peacemaker, but he was willing to to take the step and take the risk. So therefore, then he nobody could question what he was doing. He wasn't doing it for any notoriety. He wasn't doing it for anything other than he believed that he was the right person, the right place at the time to have all the young men who went away and were forgotten. I mean, there are no there are no memorials on any in any Catholic churches that I'm aware of. Yet in my town in Rafo, there are memorials in the churches to the Protestants, the Presbyterian Church and the Church of Ireland. So it's as if, well, no Catholics ever went to war, you know, mm. right. There were more Catholics went to war from Ireland than there were Protestants, but they were, they were just, they came back at the wrong time.
they, they, 1916 happened and 1918 happened. And so when they returned, as we all know, um, people shut up about them and they didn't admit they had a, a relative died or, or, um, or had ever been involved. Um, and when I went out for the opening of the Peace Park, I met a family who told me the story of get it, they had sold, they had just sold their house in 1998. And they got a message from the people that had bought the house and said, look, there's a box of memorabilia in the attic. Do you want it? Uh, we bring it over to you. And they said, well, what is it? I'm sure it's not important. And they said, oh, oh, it is. It's it's uh, war medals and, you know, from the First World War. And they said, well, that's not ours. And said, well, your family name is in it. So it turned out that the grandfather had actually died in the First World War and they, uh, the family didn't know because the, his wife didn't tell anybody. She kept quiet about it. So there were lots of stories like that. So people, you know, just put their medals and their and their death certificates into boxes and put them in the attic. And that was a tough, tough thing to have to do. <coughs> it's you said a very beautiful thing and you, um, at your father's funeral about how, you know, you had an image of when he would enter the gates of heaven, the path would be lined yeah. with the Irish soldiers he helped um, have remembered again. Yeah. Um, could you tell me what you think your father's legacy is? Well, his his certainly his legacy has been. Um, someone said to me he lived, <coughs> excuse me, in the spirit of grace. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just I've got a tickle in my throat. Am I going Sorry. to the water? Yeah, do 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 do. do. <coughs> Yeah, my father's legacy, he, um, someone said to me that they never understood, it was a, um, an, an atheist, um, you know, Presbyterian, he said atheist, uh, what the state of grace was in the Catholic faith, but he believed that my father had it. Uh, his legacy is as someone who always saw the good in people. When he took a notion, he followed it through, um, and it was always for the betterment be it his constituents or uh, it was never he was selfless and I think that that he he um if he was around now I mean he, he would have been let's say be a minister he should have been a minister he should have been he should have raised up through the ranks but he always stood his ground in what he believed so he fell out with um Liam Cosgrave because he was my father was of the Declan Coslo more um liberal um and so he i suppose his greatest legacy really is what he did to have the soldiers remembered he opened up the the biscuit tins as i uh, i was trying to make a documentary so the, the the locked biscuit tins he opened up he helped people um be proud of the relative who went to war and didn't come home um and you know that's i'm very very proud of of what he did i mean he and he he just did it he just went got on with it um and he had an amazing ability to get people to come on board with him he was never like i would think about ringing somebody up and asking them to give money it wouldn't have crossed his mind he would just pick up the phone and say say to them i need this amount of money are you able to give it and people kind of couldn't say no to him and didn't say no to him. So the Peace Park was built with a huge um, generosity um, of people from all walks of life in Ireland. So, I mean, everybody like on um, CIE, um, everybody helped, you know, with with um, the building of the Peace Park. The the, the that's his legacy um, that he 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 um, he achieved. Um, I suppose he gave people um, back uh, their sons and their husbands and their grandfathers. He gave them back as proud men who left um, Ireland to do what they believed was right. And also because they needed money. Um, and they were, they uh, people didn't, I suppose, later on, um, people didn't ignore them purposely, but they just weren't talked about because it was easier not to talk about it. And um, so he allowed that to happen. He, he opened up the conversation um, and he helped bring the, you know, he did lay the, it would have happened, but he, he, he helped pave the way for the queen to come to Ireland when she did. 
you know, yeah. it could be now when she's coming and she wouldn't come <laughs> because she'd be yeah. old, you know. And I think it was important it was her that came and not mm. not um, a younger generation, you know, of, mm. of royalty. I think she she lived through it all. So she, um, and she did, you know, that's, you know, that's something, I, you know, that, I, and hopefully I, I do believe that my father's legacy will, will, will will continue you know that that it, that he he's there and you know martin again as you to speak to me about him and you say your father and myself don't have the same politics but i think he's an amazing man and i really admire him so that that to me was something you know that you know he he obviously had been talked about with him you know and mm. um he had his faults too but you don't have to go down there with them <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose the last question also about legacy, um, and it's uh, we're we're in this decade of centenaries now, um, of the period I suppose from nineteen twelve to twenty three, um, and I think your your generation and you in particular where you were brought up and you know your career trajectory and everything and your father, you've got a really um, just a really interesting insight into that legacy piece, I think. And what, what would you characterize as the legacy of that decade, 100 years on? Um, it's, it was a very, uh, it was a very difficult, um, Ireland um, has not had an easy history ever. I mean, the history of Ireland has been complex. Um, the decade uh, from 1916 onwards has been a very, very difficult time in our, in our history. Um, but it has sometimes, you know, to to develop and and carve out a. Oh, I don't know what that banging is that you can hear. Um, <laughs> I hope it's not a bomb. <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> yeah, I don't know what the bang, what the noise is outside. Anyway, um, I suppose that for me, the memory of the decades, um, or the centenary, almost like uh, the decades of of the, that particular period, um is one that I would wish hadn't happened. It was a difficult time. And as I said, um, you know, had had the 1916 not happened, 1918 would not have happened and the Civil War would not have happened um, and it, it would have been easier. So um, lessons should be learned that, you know, it's it, to avoid at all, at all costs, to avoid um, um, war, to avoid conflict. Um, so the resolution, the conflict resolution, which is the great buzzword of today, they may not have had the hindsight or they may not have had that, may have it in hindsight. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I suppose maybe I'm, I'm not putting it in, in such good terms, but um, it was a difficult period in Irish history, um, a traumatic period in Irish history, but it may have also made people be very real and very strong. And it also allowed for our politicians to come through the system, having gone through a dreadful civil war. They knew what it was like. They knew how tough it was. Um, so they were toughened up. Um, and, you know, there's sometimes they talk about, you know, the, all, the, only the wealthy and the, you know, were members of, of the part of the government and, and, you know, in the, in the early days of, of, of the formation of the new state. But they were people that sacrificed a lot. They were the people that were educated. They were the thinkers, but they were also the gunmen. They were also the makers and shakers and doers. And they, they were they formed our state. Um, and we shouldn't we shouldn't ignore. Um, you know, sometimes the great credit is given to 1916 and the the uprising of 1916, and that's how the state was formed. But you should not, and I don't believe that we should forget the people that set up the state, that established the Irish state, who had a very difficult task in hand to do that and to take over, you know, from the uh, British authorities. Um, so it's it's a great, um, you know, it's a great um, legacy, I think, for to those people who established the new state. 